Hello, everyone, and welcome to another uh, session for the certificate program in practice-based research methods. This virtual session is facilitated by the Clinical Directors Network and the N Squared, a network of virtual training series funded by the AHRQ. Um, this gives you live access to uh, the course sessions and speakers as part of the of this certificate program, uh, which is developed by Dr. James Warner, um, and to, and in partnership with and the support of eight AHRQ funded PBRN centers of excellence. At this time, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. James Warner. OK. Uh, well, welcome, everyone, to our first training seminar. Uh, so um, I'm Jim Warner. and talked talk with you, many of you on Tuesday at our orientation session. Um, so it's really a great privilege to introduce our our presenter for today, Kurt Spangi. Um, Kurt is a practicing physician and public health uh, doc and epidemiologist who's been at Case uh, for 27 years, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Uh, he's an American Cancer Society clinical research uh, professor. And some of you may know him as the editor of the Annals of Family Medicine, uh, which is a very highly ranked primary care journal. Kurt's been active in practice-based research. Uh, I first met Kurt probably in 1994. He was active in PBRN even before that. Um, he has expertise in really multi-method assessment of practices and participatory research. Um, really uh, studied the integration, personalization, and prioritizing functions of family medicine, primary care, and community health. Um, he is past president of the North American Primary Care Research Group, or NAPCRAG. Uh, he's a member of the U.S. Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and uh, we couldn't think of anybody uh, more well-suited to do our first kickoff webinar than Kurt. Uh, so, Kurt, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome to the group. Thank you, Jim. So I appreciate the introduction, and I really appreciate this old picture which shows no white in my, uh, in my hair there. Um, so what I'd like to do today is just try to provide some context for uh, the fellowship and what you're going to be, uh, be doing. Um, so I'll start off by just talking a little bit about practice-based research networks, what the rationale is for them, and then give you, try to give you a really brief history. We'll try to relate that then to the process of actually doing research and to try to make that real, I'm just going to give you some examples of practice-based network research. And these are mostly from my own personal experience. So, so they're an idiosyncratic uh, array. But just to try to give you a sense of what others have done in practice-based networks as far as research to provide some background to thinking of what you're going to do. And then we'll step back a little bit and think about how practice-based research networks have been or organized and how they develop. Uh, so that you can think about how you want to work with existing networks or maybe even uh, develop a network of your own. Uh, I'd like everybody for a second if you, just to unmute yourself. And when I put up this next slide, um, I'd just like you to unmute and cough a couple times if, you, if you've seen this, this uh, picture before. <laughs> Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that that's about a third of the, the group that's familiar with this. Um, listen to how I go over this slide, because at the end of this fellowship, oh, yes, please mute yourself. <laughs> um, it'll just make things clear. Um, listen to how I present this slide. At, at the end of this fellowship, uh, people expect you to be experts in practice-based network research, and you're going to want to use this slide at the beginning of most presentations you do when you're talking about PBR and research. So this is a slide about a study that a number of you are familiar with called the Ecology of Medical Care, first published in 1961 in the New England Journal of Medicine by Carl White. And then uh, in 2001, Larry Green and College at the Graham Center, using good national data, reanalyzed it. 
And what it looks looks at is a thousand people. But there's an echo. I wonder if you need to get rid of it. No, the talk lets him talk. Let's him talk. Um, we just we're hearing a little bit of an echo. Just going to take a second. Because someone is not muted. Okay. So. If I take off the talk, will that get rid of the echo? I think try that. Uh, so, I wonder if that gets for the echo. It yes. does. Okay, good. Can everyone please make sure that they are muted at this time? Testing. Okay, you're good. Thanks, Amanda. That's Amanda Ross behind me, who uh, leads our practice based research network share resource. Okay, this Ecology of Medical Care study provides a good rationale for practice based research. And using a uh, nationally representative data, it looked at a thousand people living in the community. And in a given month, 800 people of those 1,000 report some symptoms. 327 consider seeking uh, medical care. 217 visit uh, a physician's office. About half of those are a primary care office. And then you can see 65 go to a CAN provider and so on. Uh, 13 visit an emergency department. Eight are hospitalized. And less than one person in a month is hospitalized in an academic medical center. So the rationale for PBR in research is this small box, which is even smaller if we did it to scale. The small box here is where most research is conducted. Practice-based research networks typically work out here, where most people get most of their care most of the time. And if you're working in, in public health or in community health, you're actually working out, working out here. So uh, you'll, you'll want to use this when you're presenting about, about PBRNs. Um, one of the rationales then for practice-based research is that it gets does research where most people get most of their care. Um, this next slide shows a, a bulletized version of the definition for practice-based research networks by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And so they define a PBRN as a group of practices devoted primarily to taking care of patients. And they emphasize primary care, although there are more and more networks that are not just about primary care. So these, networks, these practices that primarily are about taking care of the folks affiliate in a, mission, in a mission to investigate questions that are relevant to community-based practice and to try to improve the quality of care and improve the health of the people they serve individually and in their communities. One thing that distinguishes a PBRN from studies that are done in practice is that they have an ongoing commitment to the network activities. So sometimes you'll get to get a group of practices to do one study. What makes it a network is that you get together with an ongoing commitment to generating new knowledge. So the structure then transcends any single, single project. Often it links practicing clinicians with people that are more focused on research with investigators. And there's also a commitment to enhancing the skills, particularly the research skills of network members. So that's the definition of ARC, and that's relevant because ARC has funded a fair amount of practice-based network research and infrastructure over the, the years. The approach of practice-based networks then is to engage clinicians on the front lines of patient care in a participatory approach that involves developing, being involved in developing and framing the research questions, often involved in gathering the data, certainly involved in interpreting the findings, and then in closing the loop by implementing the findings in practice. Um, the reference for this slide are two, two articles that you got in advance of this. this. The next point here is from the article by Paul Thomas, and it talks about networks having both top-down and bottom-up leadership. And that's a, that's a key feature. So often the top-down leadership might be from an academic health center, might be from investigators, might be people that are primarily researchers uh, or people that are involved in a healthcare organization. But the bottom up are really people that are on the front lines of, of providing health care and increasingly in the front lines of receiving health care. So increasingly networks are involving networks of, of patients uh, as, as well. Um, the idea behind practice-based research is that it translates research into practice and then the ideas and questions of practice into research about the problems that most people have most of the time. So the research then is more likely to be relevant to real people in their lives, the lives of patients and families and communities, and the lives of people trying to provide care. And there is some evidence that things that are done in practice-based network research uh, is more likely to actually be translated into practice. 
uh, practice-based research centers have grown. These are studies that were done at these, these time points from 28 that were found in a survey done in 94 to 111 in 2008 in a latest survey that was just published are 169 active networks in the, in the country, and that includes a few that are still additional networks that are in the process of developing or, or retrenching. And there's often a cycle of networks getting together and being active and then getting less active over time, depending on a variety of factors. Uh, these are our historical roots. Networks really were started in the UK and in the Netherlands uh, with sentinel networks that were really trying to look at uh, can these practices that are on the front lines of providing care provide epidemiological data on illness in the in the community, and then they developed to, to doing uh, doing more research studies. And some of the networks in the UK, in particular in the Netherlands, do are able to do longitudinal studies because they have a relatively captive and stable patient population and really follow people over time in a way that most of our networks in our fragmented U.S. healthcare system have a hard time doing. Uh, within the U.S., the Ambulatory Sentinel Practice Network, ASPEN, was a large, actually, binational network in the U.S. and Canada uh, that at its, at its peak involved, I think, more than 700 uh, practices, or at least more than 700 clinicians across the country. That's morphed into the national network of the American Academy of Family Physicians. The Pediatric Research and Office Settings is a similar national network of pediatric practices whose infrastructure is provided by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, by the way, uh, Mort Wasserman, who's run that for decades, is stepping down. They're looking for a new director. The Dartmouth Co-op uh, Information Network was one of the first networks, and it started around practices that were linked around doing education and then moved on to doing research and now does a lot of quality improvement. And the Wisconsin Network ran as listed as one of the, uh, the Vanguard early, uh, early networks. But these are, these are really examples. Right now, 169 in the U.S., People have done back of the envelope calculation and suggested that these networks provide access to about 10% of the patients in the U.S. There's an international federation of practice-based research networks that links uh, networks. ARC funds a, a resource center uh, for, for networks, and they've been funded by a, quite a variety of, 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 um, of funding agencies, some providing infrastructure support that's usually hard to come by, uh, more often providing uh, support for actual uh, research projects. Um, Practice-based networks link research and quality improvement. And the article that's referenced there by Jim Mould and Kevin Peterson makes a good case. And as you're thinking about what you're going to do, that's a very helpful idea that there's a continuum between things you're doing to generate knowledge that's relevant at the local level of a practice. And when that knowledge becomes more generalizable and transportable, that's when it bumps over to doing research. And that's one way of making research relevant is there's it's information that's relevant for improving the quality of, of practice. Um, so that, that, that link between quality improvement and research, um, that line is a, is a fuzzy line in practice-based research networks. And the ability to go back and forth between quality improvement and research is, I think, something very helpful about making research relevant in networks. Um, the researcher and the participant in the research uh, often are merged in practice-based research. Sometimes people in the practice will be subjects, sometimes patients will be subjects, and sometimes they'll be true participants and they'll be researchers themselves. And then increasingly practice-based networks are really linking with public health and with community resources around social and environmental determinants of, of health. There's a lot of interest in working across these multiple levels, and so PBRNs are well positioned to answer some of these tough questions about how do we uh, improve the quality of health care but also then how do we actually improve the health of people and, and populations. The field is evolving. When these practice-based research networks started, most practices were independent businesses. And if a practice wanted to participate, that usually meant that the lead clinician wanted to participate, and if she or he said so, it was so. Um, now, most practices, most clinicians are employed. Uh, they're part of larger systems. And that provides some advantages in terms of perhaps infrastructure support, uh, but it also increases the complexity of doing practice-based network research. Uh, more disciplines are involved. It's not just primary care anymore, although most PBRNs still are in primary care. And there's new models of what a PBRN looks like. And, and you doing this fellowship can be 
helpful in thinking about this. We want you to understand the history of PBRNs, and we want you to be part of the vanguard that's looking at how do networks get reinvented in a new era where there, there's not as much slack in people's lives. I mean, people in practice are busy all day. Um, healthcare reform has increased access to care and made it uh, made people busier. People go home and there's less time to get together for evening meetings to think about research questions because they're we're spending two hours at night finishing up our electronic medical records. We also have opportunities to use healthcare uh, administrative data and electronic medical record data that we didn't have before, and to work with other organizations, be that healthcare systems, partnerships between healthcare and and, and public health and patient organizations. So networks of practices are often partnering to do other things than research, looking at how the problems they're trying to solve can be research questions for a practice-based research network. There's a lot of opportunities there. This is one way of thinking about how to do uh, research. So it starts with identifying the knowledge gap. Then you go to the literature, find what the information, uh, what's out there. Um, from that, you start focusing a question. Um, often that kind of, you go back and start identifying a different gap. There's a little circle that happens here. You design a study, collect the data, analyze and interpret, and then implement it. So this, this circle uh, takes place within practice-based research networks as, as well, and typically involves participation of the practices, uh, often they're, they're People, uh, clinicians, other people in the practice, conversations across practice, uh, conversations between practitioners and networks, conversations with patients to identify the questions. And there's a dance between thinking about what's the question, looking at what's already known, thinking about what's feasible to do in practice, what's relevant, and you have to be between this and focusing uh, a research question between what's practical to do and what's already known. And then you're always asking the question of what's relevant uh, to the key, the key players in practice. When we're meeting with practitioners in our network and where people want to start having a discussion about organizing a question, we have a worksheet that asks them these seven questions. So I'll just give this to you because it's sometimes helpful in just starting. So you start thinking about what's the question and then what's already known about this and how can I help you refine the question. Then you think about, okay, who would be in the study? What would you measure? How would you collect the, collect the data? And then you think about, well, what's feasible to do? Um, and then often you'll refine what your, what your plan is. And after you've done all those refinements, then you, you ask at the end, well, is this still, still worth doing? So that's often a helpful way when you're thinking about your own studies or when you're working with others in the network or academic or other partners to think about these questions. So that's all been kind of high level. And I just want to get on the ground a little bit and just give you some examples of kind of things that uh, practice-based research networks have done. So I've got a few categories of this. The first category are studies where the findings actually have changed practice. And this will give you a little bit of a historical view of what PBRNs have done in the past. So this first study was done by the Ambulatory Sentinel Practice really near, the, near their, their beginning. And at one of the practice meetings, the network meetings, clinicians were talking about um, what happened when women came into their practice with miscarriages. And at the time, all the textbooks said that every woman, said dogmatically, every woman with a miscarriage, with a spontaneous abortion, should have a, a DNC, a, a procedure to scrape the lining of the uterus. Um, and people are talking, say, do you do that? Well, yeah, but some, not all the time. And people realized that they didn't do what all the textbooks said that they should be doing. And so there was either some that was either a quality problem, either everybody was doing bad practice, or maybe there was some wisdom out in practice what people were, were doing um, and that, that they needed some research. So they designed a CARD study, a study that's a classic PBRN method where they decided a few data parameters that could be collected on a, on a card, on, on one piece of paper. And so people in the network that were interested in this study they filled out a card every time they saw a woman with a spontaneous abortion. Sent those into the research office, the Aspen Research Office, and the research office called patients to get the follow-up of what happened. And they found that um, there was a lot of variability on whether uh, women actually were given a DNC, and they found that many women weren't, 
And generally they did just fine unless they were further along in gestational age or having a lot of bleeding and, and cramping. So that, after that study was replicated a couple of times, really did change practice. And if you look at the textbooks, it's, it's much less dogmatic about that and talks about the opportunity to individualize care. So a variation of practice, people on the ground had a question that was at variance with what the experts said based on research that was done in, in referral populations and academic centers and did a study of practice that did end up uh, changing practice. Um, Aspen also then had a network with other networks of international collaborators based on the natural experiment that in the U.S. we were at the time of this study was done pretty much putting all children with an ear infection on antibiotics for 10, 10 days. That was what we all did. And in the U.K. they tended to do the same thing but for five days. And in the Netherlands they hardly ever used antibiotics. And so it would have been hard to do a, a clinical trial in the U.S. of those three different approaches because, well, that's different from standard of care. But they looked across the three countries and found that we probably were doing a lot more antibiotics that we need. And over time, this and follow-up research then has changed our practice. We are less dogmatic about all children needing antibiotics for otitis media. Um, a number of, of networks have done studies uh, where they've done facilitated approaches to quality improvement and found that that can help to improve preventive service delivery and, and other, uh, and other um, uh, quality of care measures. So networks have done intervention studies to improve quality of care. Often after they've done observational studies to really understand where things fit into practice. Uh, this next study was done in the Safety Net Provider Strategic Network, the Safety Net Practice Network in the greater Cleveland area. And they did two card studies asking the question of what's the difference between diabetic patients in good control and not so good control? There's a card study looking at comparing that where they had clinicians fill out uh, information on, on that. And then they, they got a, uh, an MPH student to go and do an in-depth follow-up study. And they found, interestingly, that clinicians um, really identified system problems that got in the way of people caring for their diabetes. And when they asked the patients, the patients tend to blame themselves, oh, I don't take our meds and bear with my diet. The clinicians said, well, it's the system things around you that make that hard to do. The follow-up study then found that people that were in good control often had had an epiphany, some turning point that often involves something that happened in the lives of their family or, or friends. So that was helpful in both looking at what's going on in practice, looking at how patients and clinicians make attributions about that, and when people are able to make changes in their lives, find what helps with that. And, it, and the practice has been using that to look for these turning points in people's lives and to really try to support people when they're at one of these teachable moments. Networks also do re research that's not only trying to improve practice on the ground, but that's relevant for, for policy. So this is a study that we did um, just on the natural experiment of corporations uh, rebidding their insurance uh, contracts every year or two. And we found that in Northeast Ohio at the time we did this study, um, we, uh, that a quarter of people in primary care with a managed care kind of insurance had been, uh, had been forced to change their primary care position the last two years. And then we documented that they had poor quality of, of care. Uh, this is one of my favorite studies from the observational study done in the RAP network and then followed up in Aspen, looking at care provided by family physicians. There's a hidden care that during 18% of visits to family physicians, care is provided for what was called a secondary patient, someone other than the identified patient for that visit. So a family member comes in and you provide some care with them or you ask about another family member who's not even, even there. So that was documented in a regional network and then documented on a, in a national network. So networks often can collaborate with each other. This was a national network that couldn't collect the in-depth information but had a bigger sample. So they, they, these two networks collaborated on this study. Let's get this one. Um, this is a study that was just published last year that showed that a facilitator working in practice can result in dramatic improvements in quality of care. What's interesting about this study is it was done in our pediatric uh, practice-based research network in the greater Cleveland area. And as they were looking, that healthcare system was looking at, at 
applying for uh, a, a Medicaid, a convo care organization, they use the data from this practice-based research network to say, well, these are the, our networks of practices and our healthcare system network, and that helps them to get a, a, a large Center for Medicare and Medicaid uh, CMM, CMS grant uh, to launch their, their convo care organization. So it's just helpful to think about you can do research that affects policy sometimes directly. The research then informs a policy change that lets uh, this healthcare system then try to take a more uh, value-based approach to caring for patients and getting new resources to provide to practices. So this, these facilitators that were in a research study now are hired and actually expanded in the network as part of their infrastructure for these new ways of paying for care. Okay. So Amanda's telling me I need to project more, and, and uh, I will try to do that because uh, my wife tells me I mumble too. So PBRNs also develop methods. So I mentioned the card study method, and, and if you're using that method, here are some helpful resources to cite that just show that these weekly return cards are accurate. In fact, in that spontaneous abortion study that I started off mentioning as an example, they did a validation study of the CARD study compared to the medical record for documenting spontaneous abortions and found that the CARD actually documented a higher number of spontaneous abortions. And the reason for that is that it picked up um, uh, women that were seen in the emergency department or the hospital for care uh, that wasn't documented in the medical record. So it actually was a more sensitive measure than the electronic medical record. Um, this is a, these are a series of, of papers from the OCHIN network, which is a practice-based network of community health centers in I think now 19 states around the country that have a common electronic medical record. So OCHIN is really one of the vanguards of having the networks not have to do a lot of work collecting data, but really drawing in data from the electronic medical record and other sources, and then linking that with public health data, healthcare system data, so the questions can be asked often from the perspective of either policymakers or questions from the on-the-ground perspective of, of practices, um, and then using doing analysis of existing data, as well as then selectively collecting additional data when, it's, when the record doesn't have what you want. And Fortune is an example of a number of, of, of networks that are developing patient engagement panels. And at the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, at least for a little while, depending on whether they're refunded by Congress, is a good supporter of practice-based research, having a way of, of having patients involved in an ongoing basis and considering what questions to be asked in, in interpreting the data, having a patient engagement panel is a nice infrastructure that more PBRNs are, are putting into place. I want to mention that uh, there's a growing interest in what's called implementation science or dissemination and, and implementation uh, research, where you take things that are known to be effective in narrowly focused studies, often done in academic health centers, and ask, how can this be relevant? How can it be practical to do in the real world? How do you implement something in the real world that's been found in more specialized centers to work? So that's a whole area of research now. I've put the link to a program announcement from the NIH. There's a standing NIH study section now that does implementation or dissemination implementation science research. Practice-based research networks are very well positioned to do this kind of research, and it's it's a uh, it's very much been legitimized uh, lately. This is a study I'll mention because this is a study we did in Cleveland when we were frustrated that our IRB that did the human subjects protection took months sometimes to approve these very simple low-risk card studies where we were collecting de-identified data. Each one was looked at the same way that a new uh, intervention study for a, a cancer drug was, look, was looked at. And we went to talk to our IRB head, and he said, hmm, why don't you just do a study of the card study method? And then every new question you do with a card study, unless it's a real complicated protocol, you just do it as an addendum to your existing IRB protocol, and it gets administratively approved in a week. So we published this uh, paper 
uh, and the, the, the appendices give you actually an example of a couple of RV protocols, and that's a way of, of really making card studies easy to do. And I'll mention that this is in the Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine. So a number of the citations have been from that, and that journal every year has a PBRN research supplement. So the PBRN research is published widely, and you want to think about the audiences. But for methods, things like this, or studies that are really about PBRNs, it's nice to have that one journal once a year. You can count on them having a call for proposals. So that's a nice outlet for PBRN research. Um, another way of making research that's quality improvement research, intervention studies to improve quality of practice, helpful to practices is that uh, physicians now to meet their uh, requirements for uh, recertification uh, for their board exams, that the part four uh, maintenance certification requires doing quality improvement projects and practices. Often the board certify one physician at a time, but as part of other protocols, you can you can have the protocol meet the requirement for this maintenance certification, and that's a huge advantage to the practices. That's one of the things you you always are trying to think about in practice-based network research. What's the question that's relevant for practice? How does that meet a larger fill a larger hole in in knowledge in a way that's important? And then how can you make it worthwhile, either low burden or the burden is worth it for the practices. And so meeting the part four maintenance and certification requirements is one thing to think about. And more and more networks are, are doing this now. One network really linked with public health and looked at how by identifying uh, certain kinds of illnesses that, uh, that were markers, in this case for, for possible anthrax exposure, so that it gets back to the original idea of practice-based net networks as being sentinel, as being on the vanguard. And people, networks are identifying influenza and being vanguard for that. So that's another thing that networks can, can do. And one thing I just want you to have in your bag of tricks, particularly if you're starting a new network, is that one good way to start a new network is to collect data using the method that the National Ambulatory Medical Care Study, NAMSIS, does. Uh, NAMSIS asks clinicians to, uh, on a sample of patients, fill out a sheet of paper that collects some detailed information on those visits. Um, and if you do that in a network, that's a way of characterizing the network. And then you can provide feedback to the practices of how their sample of patients compared to other sample in the network. And then you can compare that to the national data. And that sets you up to show the representatives representativeness of your network for other studies. So you can show the representativeness of your network compared to national data, and you can provide feedback to the individual practices on how their, uh, their practice compares to other practices in the network. And we all tend to feel isolated in practice, so that's some, some added value. The next slide shows what, you can't really see it, but it gives an idea of what it's like. It's a one-page sheet that, sh that shows a little information on the reason for visit, um, what the diagnoses were, and you can add other information to do a bunch of other studies while you're doing this uh, methodological study. The last category I, I want to have is sometimes in a network, you'll have individual clinicians who will have ideas, and so one of the things you can do sometimes is to support them to do small studies in their own practice. So this just shows a lot of studies by Bob Blankfield, who's a clinician in our network who participates in most of the network studies. But he's also done a lot of studies in his own practice that then sometimes become network studies. He started off with a study looking at what is the diagnosis that people have when they come in with leg swelling. And he got five or six other practices to study that and had a shocking finding that most people with leg swelling in practice um, don't have venous insufficiency, which is the most common clinical diagnosis we make. And most people actually have undiagnosed pulmonary hypertension, which was a shocking finding. He did follow-up studies then showing that most of those actually have undiagnosed sleep apnea. And then he's done other studies of that. So one kind of physician who's just interested, he's in solo practice and curious, has his own line of inquiry within the network, sometimes working in his own practice, sometimes working in the network. And most networks have one or two people like this, and it's worth supporting them in their, their work. And they often have really interesting ideas. There's another line of inquiry from David Hahn in the, in the Wisconsin network looking at chlamydia infections 
as a cause for asthma, often adult onset asthma. And again, we've had a whole line of inquiry in the network and often involving other networks about this. So that just gives you a little bit of the lay of the land of the types of studies that are done in PBRN. Uh, I'd like to just step back and then look at how practice-based research networks are organized, because there's lots of ways of organizing, but they're, they're often differently organized. So the first cut I'll take is just on geography and size. So there are these international networks. I showed one example of that. Uh, national network like the, uh, the PROS pediatric network or the National Family Medicine uh, network, state-based state network, regional networks, networks that are within a single healthcare system that often has the advantage of a common electronic medical record, or some that are really about the common EMR. I mentioned the Ocean, Net Ocean Network, even preceding them was the practice partners uh, network, people that had that one EMR. And then consortiums of consortium networks that get together for larger studies, often studies where you'd want variability, say, in the healthcare system with the local environment. You can also take cuts on networks looking at how they're affiliated, and often this means who supports them. So the national networks that get their support from the national professional organization, from state academies, uh, from an academic entity, from a hospital or healthcare system, or from an electronic medical record uh, vendor. Um, networks often are started by some initiating event. Some of them start around a mission. I mentioned our safety net provider strategic alliance. It got together with safety net practices that said we want to generate new knowledge to help us improve the quality of care for our patients and then to close the safety net for the disadvantaged people we take care of. So sometimes they get together around the mission. Often they'll start just with one individual or a small group that's got to be in the box. They just like the idea of a network or a particular topic. Some networks get together just based on the belief in the wisdom gained from practice or maybe as a reaction against so much of the new knowledge being generated just from academic health centers. Some start around electronic medical record. Some start around, around a single question or idea, and for those to succeed long term, they, they need to pay attention to not being just about that one study or idea, or they tend to, tend to die. But you can start around one study or one idea. Um, and sometimes they start around a particular funding announcement opportunity or the idea of a quality improvement uh, network or sharing best practices. The Oklahoma network is a good example of a network that's really explicitly a best practices network where they study how people are approaching practice. They look for variation, interesting variation, and say, hmm, these people seem to be doing better than others. Let's go look for that and study that and learn from that. Network experience in leadership with both top down and, and, and bottom up in a mix is often best. Um, and who leads different projects? Different people will lead different uh, different projects within the, the network. The ideas come from different sources, from a clinician's practice. Content experts often come to a network. Network leaders have to do a dance between someone coming and saying, I want to use your network to study this. And the network leader's conversation usually as well. First of all, it's not my network. And second, if you want to have a successful relationship, you don't use the network. You can come with expertise and resources and a question, and then there's a conversation that happens about how that can be relevant to the network, uh, how the network can be helpful to answering that, that, that question. But content experts can be very helpful in getting funding and getting things done. Sometimes the ideas come from funders, and often there's a group process that happens to really refine the, the question. Um, networks vary in how they design or find their studies. Often there are small groups that include a practitioner's perspective, someone with me methods expertise, content expertise, someone who says, I know this literature, someone who can do pilot testing. So if you have groups that are finding questions that have all this expertise, the on-the-ground practitioner expertise, someone who's got methods expertise, someone who's got content expertise on the topic and access to literature, someone who can get a pilot test done, that's very helpful. That's, that's the kind of grouping of expertise you need to get things done in a network. And then networks are variably funded and often have uh, a lot of different funding sources to be stable. It's often opportunistic, uh, involves grants. Um, very often academic departments or professional organizations um, uh, 
You're fucking with your, sure your face. A little more direct. <laughs> okay. My, my colleagues think you want to see my face, so they're making me more visible. Um, uh, clinical and translational, translational science awards are large infrastructure grants that are present in 62 institutions around the country, and if your institution has one, um, often is part of their community research on um, they will support PBR in research. That's variable around the country, but often it's been a, a, a source of support. So often academic departments or CTSAs, professional organizations. I have an endowment down below. I don't know of a lot of examples of that, but the idea of having a network endowed I think is a good idea. And then networks do different things to develop the skills of the people in the network. This fellowship program that you're participating in is one example. Some just help people learn stuff through specific projects, uh, participating in different, uh, uh, different projects or contributing to, to that. Often, almost all networks have steering committees that get sophisticated in research over time just by working with different investigators on different projects and bringing practice expertise. Um, often we have workshops across Ohio in another two months we're having uh, a biannual uh, practice-based mm -hmm. research network festival, we call it, where we'll share research findings but we'll also do development things, uh, fellowships and then distance learning, things like this. And then networks have various levels of involvement. There's, there's a potential network of practices and practitioners and partners that are involved in communicating in some level. They get variably involved uh, depending on what the projects are and depending on what else they have going on. So there's leadership that often involves administration, the steering committee, um, and then it involves contributing data, participating in different stages of idea generation, implementation, dissemination, and, and that levels of involvement vary over, over time. Data collection from various sources from the practice themselves, like a card study, to using the EMR, um, and different methods have been used over time from direct observations of the return card to, to medical record data to, to, to surveys. Uh, data analysis often is done centrally within the network or involves uh, academic partners. And then here's a few characteristics of networks that have been successful over time. They, they have a clear pathway for clinician involvement in both governance and operation, and they're always thinking about what's in it for the different par participants. Um, they often have a network, network of researchers that develop expertise in learning how to work with the network. And there's some people, some investigators that just don't want to invest the time in morphing their questions based on how to make them relevant to practice or feasible, and they tend to drift away. Some investigators will get good at that and will become uh, repetitive partners for with networks. Uh, it helps us, to, helps to have leadership that really is going to just keep uh, keep at this. That's visionary, but also that works behind the scenes a lot to get things done. Often quietly, often often servant leadership. There's often a large bit of uh, dose of volunteerism by the partners, and it often involves people that recognize that there's something they have something more in working together that they don't have just working by themselves and are willing to invest in developing relationships. We've mentioned diversified uh, funding stream and then uh, then partners to provide support. The scholarly output often is, is shared and making sure that the clinicians that did the work get acknowledged or opportunities for authorship is important. Often it's the academicians that are writing this up but not, not always. Collaborators can involve, be involved with it. Having writing teams that involve different stakeholders the way of, build, of building, building, building capacity and having participants have access to reviewing reviewing things. Now one personal tip for getting people to work together is to write the abstract first. So when you have a study and you're writing things up, it's to try to get the whole study from the purpose to the methods to a few sentences about results to the take-home lesson conclusions down on one paper. And if you can, that's on one sheet, it's easy to get input from diverse groups and it makes it easy to work together uh, in doing scholarly output. So just a few slides left then. Here's a few take-home uh, ideas and principles uh, for doing practice-based research. First of all, consider what's in it for the diverse participants over, over time. Uh, it's just a key thing you have to do with uh, practice-based research. You want to involve diverse partners and you're always thinking about, okay, here's what I need, but what's in it for them? 
both in the short term and the long term in developing an ongoing mutually beneficial relationship where there's give and take over time. Um, trying to have partners so that everyone gets a chance to spend as much time as possible doing what they like and what they do best. Having both top-down leadership, central leadership, and bottom-up leadership together is important. I'm thinking about both research and development. That is, how can a research project help develop expertise? How can you help develop people's expertise and relationships so that they're more able to do more and more sophisticated research? Looking for natural experiments, there are so many different changes that are happening. The practices are doing things differently. Systems are doing things differently. Lots of partnerships are developing. Thinking about how the network can be a way of studying that is a huge opportunity right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, communication is really hard when people have no time in the environment. So having ways where you communicate synchronously with people and then trying to get people together so that there's a face-to-face um, that's how you really develop the relationships in the network, and, and it's, hard, it's hard to do that, but it's really worth trying to do that. Often you do that by finding when people are already getting together for something else, professional organization meetings, for example, and having small network meetings around that. Uh, successful networks often blur the distinction between quality and improvement of research and go back and forth, a diversified funding, have a lean core infrastructure that you can expand when you have funding, say, from grants and contracts so it doesn't all go away between grants. Think about the opportunity of maintenance and certification. And then going back and forth between reflecting, thinking, what are the questions, how do we interpret that, getting things done, and going back and forth between these two. <coughs> and it's challenging that in the current kind of action-focused environment to make time for the reflection, but it's worth trying to do that. So the last question I have is, what are you going to do in your projects? And here's just some options as I was fantasizing about what you all might do. And we might want to discuss this a little bit, even as we look back on this presentation. So are you going to learn by collaborating on an ongoing project that's going on our network? That's a good way to learn. Just get involved. Just go to a meeting about that. Look at how maybe you can provide some sweat equity on a project. So they need something done that you can just go and do, be, become an author on the paper, um, help a project actually happen by just helping do what needs to be done. Those are ways of being involved in getting started, uh, working on an ongoing network study. Or you might propose a new study to a PBRN based on some expertise or work that you're willing to do, perhaps starting with a card, with a card study or a study using electronic data. If you're starting a new network, could you do a study where you characterize it using a, a national inventory medical care-like uh, data? Are you able to work with clinicians to help draw out their questions, to help them get their questions? Could you help an existing network start a patient advisory committee, which opens up a whole array of patient-centered outcomes research? Can you link a practice with a healthcare system or with public health? Could you launch a new kind of a practice-based research network? So those are just a few things to think about as far as what you're going to, going to do. And I think we'll just open it up. We'll kind of stop there and uh, uh, have a chance to, uh, to mix it up a little bit. Okay, so we can open it up for questions now. Who would like to start? <laughs> Can you press it again? Uh, so uh, this this LJ, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yes. Uh, so wow, what what, what a great uh, uh, tour uh, through the history of uh, practice space research, uh, where it's been, uh, where it's at, and where it's going. And uh, and I think bandwidth is becoming a, an increasing issue for uh, for clinicians in practice. And uh, just wanted to think for a minute about, uh, you know, how to respond to the common uh, response that, you know, I just don't have any time to... Uh, 
uh, to get involved uh, uh, in this or to help with your study and if uh, kind of uh, maybe your thoughts occurred uh, on what's been successful in, in kind of aligning uh, what uh, a researcher is wanting to do uh, uh, with with a study with uh, with practice priorities and where they're at. Sure thing, Ozzy. I'll take the first crack at it, and then I'll want you to uh, to fill in what I've missed because you have even more experience with that than I do. Um, so I think we there's no question that there's not that the bandwidth is reduced, that people have no slack in their day now, and so the two main things we think about are how can we make the projects as easy as possible uh, to, to make it as possible for the practitioners. But the staffs of practice are, are all the same way. The staffs of practice can do more, but often they're stretched thin as well. And that's, so that's always a worthwhile thing to do. The other way to approach it, though, is to look at how we can make this as meaningful as possible. Because when we don't really have time for things, we somehow find ways to make time for new things if it feels really important or it addresses something that's meaningful to us that's an unmet need that we have. So really understanding what those unmet needs are is a good source of research questions. So I think we want to think about both, both those things. How can we make the research questions and the project as meaningful as possible? How can we make it as easy as possible? How can we get others involved in providing resources, how we can how can we get support. But I really think we often don't put enough energy into making things meaningful and and what understanding what people's core motivations are. And I think that's how things really get get done. People find time for things that are important and motivating and, and get at something that's personally meaningful to them. Um, one of the things about networks that we need to do is to invest in an ongoing uh, set of relationships. So sometimes to get people to participate in the projects you want to bring them to, you have a better chance to do that if the last two times you've talked to people, you were really helping them with something that they had a real interest in need at. So thinking beyond a particular ask and thinking about investing in the relationship would be the thing. What, what, what else do you think, uh, LJ? So I, I think that uh, the relationship is is, is huge, and, and oftentimes uh, uh, we we have practices that do multiple studies with us. And when you when we think about what, why do they do that, uh, I uh, you know I think some of it's been trust that they uh, they feel like they're going to end up in a better place than where where they, where they started out. Uh, uh, and it's about relationships across the practice. Oftentimes, it's the office manager or uh, or a nurse leader that uh, actually becomes the champion of of, of uh, making change happen because uh, uh, clinicians are busy. And one of the things that uh, a number of networks have is a practice facilitation model, and they have different terms for uh, uh, what they call those practice facilitators, but. Uh, We've tried to give practice facilitators the direction that we want you to get to know your practices and don't always want you just showing up saying, we got this study we want you to do. We want you showing up and having a cup of coffee with them and figuring out, well, what's going on in your practice? You know, I'd like to know a little bit more about uh, what are some of the things that uh, that you're struggling with. And so to really not always show up when you have an ask, but to really spend some time investing in the relationship uh, because I think it'll pay off in, in the long haul if you can do that. Right. And people, I mean, we often feel isolated in our own practices. You know, we're beating our way with the people that we see. So first of all, just being understood and then seeing what other people are doing and learning from each other. There, so looking at some of those motivations and just, just finding out what's motivating for people I think is really important. That's good. Great. I see that Alex Cho has a question. And Alex, I don't know if you're on the phone line, uh, but uh, are you able to ask your question using the the uh, audio that you have now? Oh yes, yes. This is Alex. Okay. I'm, I'm dialed in. Um, and thank okay. you very much, Dr. Strange. Uh, 
Um, I guess my question is a, is a bit of a follow-up to, and you had mentioned this example of an ACO, in an ACO, uh, uh, in the context of an ACO, the use of practice facilitation by um, a PBRN to not only um, uh, carry out a study but then do something ostensibly that um, uh, kind of on that scale the ACO wanted done. I, I, am I, am I um, um, guessing correctly? Yes, exactly. And, and so I was wondering if you wouldn't mind talking more about about that. Um, in our health system, you know, we're, we're particularly challenged in that um, the, the, the health system is almost proud of how, you know, in some ways non-academic um, it is about operational things, right? And, and to your point, the, especially in primary care, you know, the focus really has been on becoming more efficient and doing as little as possible to distract providers, both for a couple of reasons. One, they want the providers to be spending as much time in the room with patients as possible, um, but, but then it makes it hard to sort of insert questions or ask, you know, the providers to, to change practice. Um, do you mind um, sharing some examples of where, you know, we, uh, PRNs have been able to turn that on its head a little bit as a, you know, and become like a partner for the kinds of, you know, efficiency and other improvements that, that, that you know, primary care networks want. Right. So I'll open it up to others to provide examples too. Um, I think one thing that we do in practice-based network research is often we don't use the R word. So if the people you're talking to are research is not at the forefront of what they're trying to do. There's a lot of people that research is something that's been done to them or it's irrelevant or, I mean, people have a lot of chips on their shoulder about research. So often we don't use the R word in having those conversations and we look at, well, what are people trying to accomplish? And often our motivations for doing practice-based network research are the same as people that are trying to get things done. Um, that, you know, they're trying to improve the quality of care. They're trying to help prevent burnout of people uh, in the front lines of practice. They're trying to help disadvantaged groups have a voice where they haven't had. All those people doing that kind of work tend to be anti-research, frankly. And so we often don't talk about research. We talk about what are they trying to do and then say, hmm, would some evaluation be helpful? Would some knowledge on the front lines be helpful? Would it help you with advocating with your funders or giving power and voice to practices or patient groups that are, are disadvantaged or feel dis disempowered? Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about them generating relevant new knowledge. Or we'll, we'll sometimes design whole research projects that don't you know, where we never use the, use the research word. Um, that example of the Rainbow Research Network, um, that started that we did this quality improvement project. Um, it started, the knowledge for that started in a study called Direct Observation of Primary Care, where we had some people centrally that wanted to improve quality of care around prevention, and that was not saleable. That was not of interest to people on the front lines. They said, you know, nobody understands what we're doing. So we said, okay, well, before we try to improve your practice, let's try to just understand your practice. And we went out and really looked at what people did, um, published a lot of studies that made people feel valued and understood. The network got very involved in writing some of those papers to get that idea out. Then once they felt understood, they were very happy and interested to do improvement work. And the improvement studies were done in a way that was tailored what we learned in the observational studies, observational studies, and then we did that. In, we did that in our family medicine network, then replicated that in this pediatric uh, network around some things that were uh, relevant and novel to them, and then that was used by the ACO to, to, to do the ACO. The ACO director is very anti-research, frankly, and so we were kind of pushed aside for a while. But now we're saying, oh, we need some evaluation, and so we talk to, with him about, about evaluation. Um, I, I wonder if others on the call have examples, though, of what they've, what they've done.
I guess one other example I'll, I'll say is, is with this, our safety net providers strategic alliance. They got together for a year and a half before they involved academic partners because they were very anti-research. Um, you know, research, they took advantage of disadvantaged populations for whom research was something that had been done to them. I mean, you know, the Tuskegee experiment of long ago was still very salient to, to them, and they specifically didn't want to be involved in research. They were about quality improvement. They were about advocacy. But then they realized that knowledge is power, and that systematically looking at things gave them more powerful stories to tell. And so they do a mix of quantitative and qualitative research that the numbers are helpful, but they have narratives to go with the numbers through the qualitative aspect of the research. They have some stories to go with the statistics. And they use that for quality improvement. They have used that for policy advocacy uh, to try to give voice to people that were uninsured. They take some pride they, in, in the Affordable Care Act that they think that some of their advocacy efforts that came from the research were helpful in, in that. And I, I see that uh, Ann Gagliotti has a question. Ann, I don't know if you're on audio um, or not. I'll give you a second to re reply if you are. Okay, I'll read your question then. Um, the okay. longer line I think oh. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Stenny. Um, Hi. Yeah, I just had a question about if anyone has looked at provider participation in PVRN um, research as a way to decrease burnout or increase satisfaction with their practice um, since they're, since networks have been doing this for some time. There's probably a cohort of people who've been participating for a while. Mm. I think it's a good study idea, actually, Anne. Um, something that might be done across <clears throat> a network of, of networks. There certainly have been studies done about why people participate and having a sense of connectedness, having a sense of intellectual stimulation, uh, having a sense of empowerment, um, getting together with like-minded colleagues are all reasons that people participate. And you would think that those would be things that would reduce burnout. And it's, it's, it's almost an ironic twist that it does take a little extra time. But if you spend time on something that's personally meaningful and makes you feel connected, um, that is something that would be helpful. I don't, I don't know if anybody specifically looked at it that way that you phrased the question, but I think it would be a really interesting thing to look at. I know uh, anecdotally, uh, I've heard from many clinicians in the past, particularly those who are in isolated areas, rural areas, and don't have a lot of interaction with other clinicians, that it really um, energizes them and satisfies their uh, intellectual curiosity to be involved in, in practice-based research. But uh, Again, that's a great great study idea. Okay, Liz Waddell, do you have a question? Yeah, and I, I had a couple of comments. I'm on the phone with we're um, we're doing a care coordination project out in four rural practices in eastern Oregon, and you know initially we had pretty high level of provider engagement, but then once we started doing data collection and developing measurement tools, the participation from the MAs and the front office staff and the back office staff and the care coordinators really took over. Um, and we've really been the most successful when we have included all levels of staff on implementation teams for projects and when we have involved those teams in the development of all of our instruments. We completely revamped um, what we had initially submitted to, to IRB, and now we've got something that the staff are invested in. And mm -hmm. they showed up for a call at 7.30 this morning before their day actually started, um, and they're not getting much. And what we are, our team is trying to brainstorm how we can incentivize participation for clinic staff, you know, even if it's a little prize or a contest, just something to thank them because that is making a huge difference. I mean, really, between getting some data or, or not getting some data. But I wanted to just put a plug in for the, the interdisciplinary teams and the, the cross functional teams. Great lesson. So this is Rowena. I wanted to just respond to Liz's idea. We have changed, I think we've changed our compensation to a practice compensation and put it into a 
clinic discretionary account that doesn't go into their usual cost center so they can use it for practice-based initiatives. So um, the clinicians or the medical director and the practice manager have classically used this fund to fund their Christmas parties, pic picnics, um, CME for the nurses or the medical assistants um, that they n normally can't get from the administration. Um, or whatever, the birthday gift fund. So they, you know, they changed our research compensation to pay for things that the practice can't normally put on the line item budget each year with the health system. So Rowena and, and Liz both are talking about having both instrumental compensation and then things that's about compensation that's about getting people together, um, recognition, uh, giving people a voice. So I think thinking about that mix is really a good idea. And it sounds like, Romina, you figure out how to set that up so it works well. When we started doing that and didn't do it well, we had a few practices where whoever was administering the money just took it and put it into a sum, and it wasn't really seen by the people that were doing the work. So it's important to have that set up so that it really, if it doesn't go to people individually, it goes to them collectively for those, those little things that get people together, make them feel valued and appreciated. It's really good. Yep. I have a question for you, Kurt. Um, in developing a PBRN, are you finding that um, it's better to organize the network of the PBRN first and then later think about research, a research study, or to kind of organize a PBRN around developing a research project? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've certainly seen it done both ways. Um, and you you kind of need both. You if you just get people together, and this isn't just about PBRNs, this is any group process. If you just get people together around an idea or working on developing the relationships, people appreciate that. But after a while, when you're busy trying to get things done, if nothing happens from it, people will drift away. On the other hand, if you're just focused on getting a task done, um, People after a while feel, start to feel devalued and just flogged by one more thing, and people will drift away from that. So it's one of the challenges, uh, one of the fun things about facilitating a network is to try to just keep that iterative balance between focusing on the task of getting projects done and focusing on the relationship and the, communi the communication. And you're always doing both to some degree. Um, networks that start around a specific project uh, need to particularly pay extra attention, even if you're getting that done, to having ways for individuals to have their ideas get actualized in other projects or in, in that, that particular project. Uh, if you're focused on just developing the infrastructure around the idea of a network, it's important to um, pick some low-hanging fruit, to have some small projects, even things that might not get published, but just that provides some useful information so people see value. So just that tension you talked about, Jim, just keeping that at the forefront of your mind and, and just trying to pay attention to both of those iteratively is, is how to really keep a successful network going. I, I do have a, another question for you, Kurt. Um, with respect to, to leadership in, in PBRNs, um, how, you know, how do you develop uh, people, clinicians, um, who become leaders in these networks and, and how important are those people in really allowing these networks to develop and be successful? Well, I think that's a good question for you to answer and LJ and other, you know, others that have been doing this for, uh, for a while. Um, there's a lot of people that can be incredibly good partners that will never come for training uh, in, in practice-based research. But figuring out what people would like to learn a little bit more about is, is, is helpful. We're having our practice-based research network festival in a couple of months. And we'll do training there just by showing people examples of projects that others have done and giving them a chance to share their own projects. So by sharing a project that someone did maybe just in their own practice and getting feedback is one of the best ways to learn 
by getting feedback on what you've already done. You can learn vicariously by looking at what other people have done. And then at that same session, we'll also have topics that people can go in and get a little bit of training uh, about. Um, we'll have a lot of workshops, and we have a, an overview of all the workshops. So we'll, we'll have people in all the workshops give a two-minute summary of the main take-home points of their, of their workshops. So just giving people an overview of what they can, can get by getting more formal training. And then as people get hooked on, on it, you know, then they might want more. I mean, Bob Langfield, whom I mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, um, actually did while he's in private practice do a part-time fellowship for, for three years. So some people will get more, more involved. Any, any others that have done uh, training things that you want to mention? You know, I think uh, uh, this LJ is that sometimes the steering committee, is, uh, some of the periods of the steering committee that's made up of of, of, of clinicians and uh, and they they kind of uh, taken ownership of things to the point that uh, you're having your festival coming up. Kurt, we've kind of evolved to where it's not so much the research investigator that's presenting. We try to get one of the uh, uh, participating uh, clinician or, or practices, even that we've had office managers present the results of the study. So it's kind of distributed ownership of, uh, of, the, of the network. And some of that is if they get recognition by doing, uh, presenting uh, the data and the results at, at various venues has, has been uh, really useful. So they view it as a partnership more than uh, th them as a setting for others to do work uh, with, with their patient populations or their mm -hmm. practice populations. Mm -hmm. okay, great. All right. Um, there's a, uh, a question. Okay, we have another question. In the chat box regarding authorship. Dr. Shu, do you have a question about authorship? Yes. <clears throat> um, I'd like to do ask Dr. Stingy about the authorship because for the PBI and research, you know, we have a lot of people involved. And the project, so in terms of writing abstract, no, the, uh, like uh, manuscript for publications, there always the tension about uh, the authorship, who should be included, and in which order, things like that nature. Do you have any um, tips or uh, experience that you can um, give us? <laughs> because like in the past, that has been occurred, but uh, thinking ahead of time, people may have some questions on that. Right. Good thinking. Um, so if you just look at publications from different networks, you can see different ways of handling that, and different journals will have different ways of handling it. Certainly trying to make sure that uh, everyone who's had significant involvement is acknowledged for that is, is important. Um, journals have authorship criteria that you can look at and that you can use to help have that conversation with people in your networks. And it's often helpful up front to say, here are the criteria that the target journals have for being an author. We would be open to anyone who would like to be an author, who would like to meet these criteria to be an author. And we certainly want everyone who's involved to have their name somewhere on the paper to be acknowledged if you want to be acknowledged. So some papers from networks will have a large number of authors because they meet the, the criteria of having been involved in the design, design and or conduct of the study and having uh, made enough of a contribution to be able to <laughs> vouch for, for what's in the manuscript, to take responsibility for, for what's in the manuscript. And so you'll see some PBRN studies that will have 10 or 20 authors. Uh, often you will have a small group that's really doing the work in putting the paper together um, that will, you'll have a handful of authors that will be done for the, the team for this project or for the network team that worked on this, and then people will be, uh, be listed in the acknowledgments. And certainly in the acknowledgments, uh, the practice is, and, and 
the, and if you can name the actual names of people that work can be can be listed. Um, so I think trying to be as inclusive as possible, working within the journal authorship um, criteria, and looking at whether people are listed as authorship or whether a small number of authors is listed for a group of authors, and then certainly putting other people in the uh, the acknowledgments in a way that uh, that fully values their contribution or the, the ways I know of it. Any other thoughts that people have about how they've seen that done well? <clears throat> LJ and Rowena, feel free to jump in. Oh. So, I mean, it's clear from some of the authorship things that it's best to discuss it early on. So there's no hard feelings at the end. Um, I do have some investigators who feel very strongly that they have to meet the international uh, guidelines for authorship, um, and they will uh, they'll try. I mean, they really do expect you to read the paper and have revisions before they will count you. So I think it just it depends. It is a great question, and it just you just have to make sure you approach that question early on. In your project and have a clear understanding of you know what counts as authorship and what participation you expect. Yeah, this is LJ. So I, I think the other thing is, is I think PBNs have an obligation in, in terms of being mentors uh, to uh, uh, clinicians that are in practices that engage in, in in this work. I think they they often see themselves as critical scientists, and uh, and so we try to make every effort. And when somebody obviously has, uh, who's particularly if it's their idea, the the study that that we uh, conduct, uh, we make every effort to mentor them and and bring them along and provide them the resources that they need so they can participate as an author. Right. And so sometimes the role of people that are leading networks, even if you're doing a large amount of writing, but if that person's baby, their their project, their idea. Is still having them be the first author, and you're you're really lower down in the support role. The reason to about about talking about that up front, I think, is a good idea, and doing that in a way that you're not locking things in at the beginning. So saying, okay, here's how we're going to get started. Here's who's going to take the lead on this, but then having <clears throat> a way of, of being open to other people stepping up and contributing uh, along the way is is a good thing to do. And sometimes if we can't fit every author on there, we do have a big acknowledgement section or an appendix of all the practices and the providers who contributed um, and what their role was. So if you know if you get pushed back from a journal about having too many authors, we do acknowledge folks and we have gotten feedback from clinicians that they were thrilled to Google their name and find out that they were acknowledged in a JAMA paper. Um, or a few JAMA papers, you know, from our network. So they were just, you know, they even though they didn't meet authorship requirements, the fact that I listed their name in their practice in the paper was a, a big thrill to them. I think I hope everyone's getting the message that having a really inclusive approach is is really important. Okay, Andrew Hunt, do you have a question? Uh, I posted a chat uh, question. <coughs> Um, regarding, I'm, I'm finding like sometimes I get overwhelmed by the diversity of possibilities at any one point. You know, like there's so many different directions you can go with a specific question. You know, like something very simple on the surface could be like, you know, could represent like five or six nested studies, you know. Yeah. And um, I find with our group, like I'm always wondering, should I be emailing this person? Should I be following up on this? Should I be like, Trying to organize more meetings, what, you know, how what's the pace of things? Trying to keep people engaged but not overwhelmed um, is difficult. So I wonder if you could comment on like the, how you stay focused on the process and how you know whether you're doing well enough with it. Because often the conversations start with wanting to answer the big hairy question, uh, and when you get down to what you're actually going to do, it, it often you often have to bite off a small portion of that. I think the idea of having something you can have a quick early success and, and you know, biting up little chunks, learning something, if you can learn that in a way that you can get a brief report out or, or something that's 
it's useful to people in the practice that are participating even before you're able to publish something uh, is a good way to do things. So starting with a big, hairy question that's motivating and then thinking about what's the first step I could take that could get something done in a short order would be helpful. If to answer the big question, one of the things you need to do is go get funding. You know, that can take years. So that's a great way to get people, have people lose lose interest. So looking at what can you do to get started on something in the short term. That's often where a card study or a data only study from an electronic medical record can be helpful in getting started while you're trying to get support for doing something larger. So I think doing things that are bite-sized, going for low-hanging fruit to begin with, doing things you can draw together and say, here's a lesson we've learned, let's disseminate this among ourselves or, or more, more broadly, while you're thinking about how that can lead to doing something on the big, uh, the big hairy question. Hey, Dennis Lemongrass, you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with data. Uh, is there a uh, data repository um, for each PBRN, or is there a way that uh, PBRNs actually share a data repository? And uh, secondly, uh, is there a uh, standardized process where data collection occurs within PBRNs? Could you say that second one again, please? Sorry. Yes. Uh, it, is there a standardized process for data collection in PBRNs? I'll do the last one first. That's easy. No. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you're, you're tailoring to the question and, and things. As far as the, the repository, different networks uh, have different uh, repositories with different levels of accessibility. I, I want someone else to help answer the question. I know quite a while ago, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality had set up a, a, a website where you could have to use this as a data repository with, with varying levels of security and access. And I haven't used that recently, and I don't know if it currently exists. Um, does anyone else know? Uh, you know, I, this tells you, I haven't seen a, a, uh, a central resource like that. Uh, you know, uh, PBRNs are a little bit like practices. When you see one practice, you see one practice. And when you see one PBRN, you see one PBRN. And, and uh, some PBRNs like Ocean have got a single platform um, uh, for, for data. And, uh, but for some of those that uh, work with a diverse group of practices, uh, uh, the uh, data uh, comes from a menagerie of EHRs and other sources. And, and uh, so we have to take the study and adapt the study uh, to, uh, to figure out how we're going to pull uh, uh, pull the data out, out of these practices. <clears throat> yeah, and I will say that with the whole PCORnet thing, um, those of us that have PBRNs within PCORnet are starting to get some hope that by putting our data in the common data model that PCORi is asking for, that we might be able to quickly query and share data across institutions and networks. But that's a future vision. <laughs> Right. right. So in the past, I think the PBRM shared research has tried to have some infrastructure for that. We're not sure if that's still ongoing in PCORN and others that are uh, are looking at large data sharing are trying to set up that infrastructure. I think most networks kind of roll their own at this point. Maybe, so maybe one more question, then we'll turn it over to Jim to kind of talk about next steps for the fellowship. I see that uh, Rachel Klamo, who is in Croatia, has sent a question in. and. Um, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, Dr. Stengi, the idea of natural experiments is new to me. Can you give me some examples? Uh, sure. So uh, a healthcare system puts in a new um, quality improvement program. All the practices did things their own way. Currently, this new thing comes in. They all have to do things a certain way. Uh, that's an intervention that someone else did and you can look at what's the outcome of that. Did it help quality? Did it hurt quality? Did it help quality for that one thing that it was focused on? Did it have uh, negative or positive spin-off of, of effects? Um, a policy change that makes people practice differently, 
and you're just studying that uh, group of practices that someone comes into town and suggests a new way of organizing things, a new group comes and people get together to talk about quality, what effect does that have? So just things that people are already doing in their, their lives that are changing things, that are an intervention of some sort, that you can study what the process and outcome of that is. I think we're actually a, a, almost out of time, and I, I want to uh, turn it over to Jim Werner now, I think, to talk about uh, what the, uh, what's in the next steps are for the fellowship. I appreciate the chance to talk with you. It feels not sufficiently interactive here, but I'm, I'm glad we got, to, we got to talk a little bit, and, and thank you for letting me do the, uh, do the first uh, session that you're having here in this fellowship. I think it's really neat, the idea that you'll be able to learn from each, from each other through this fellowship. <coughs> Well, um, I think uh, I express the sentiments of everybody. We, we appreciate so much, um, Dr. Sang, your uh, leading this first uh, webinar. Um, it has been a wonderful tour. <laughs> it's, been a great, it's been a great tour of uh, the practice-based research landscape, both um, kind of the history of networks and, and now where networks are moving, as you were talking about um, public health and uh, partnering with uh, other entities such as school systems and health departments and so forth. So this is really exciting. It's an exciting time to be getting involved in practice-based research. As it, uh, I think PBRNs are really spreading their wings and moving in new directions. And, and some of the articles that you read in preparation uh, for the, the webinar that Dr. Stenge gave today, uh, I think really point to that. So. Um, our next learning webinar will be on October 15th, and that will be with Dr. Jolt Maggie Caldi of the OKPBRN. OK and he'll be talking about, in more depth, uh, developing PBRNs, getting buy-in, maintaining buy-in, and involvement of clinicians, and then how do you really use, utilize PBRNs, and getting into that in more detail. Um, he'll also be talking uh, about staffing PBRNs with practice facilitators. He's uh, really one of the authorities on using practice facilitators in PBRNs and um, has written a, a number of papers about this. One of those is in your readings. And the readings for the October 15th webinar are available on course sites now. Uh, so you can begin uh, reading those. Um, so uh, we're really looking forward to uh, the next webinar. We appreciate Kurt providing the content on this webinar. Um, between now and October 15th, though, we'll, we'll be sending you the guidelines for the concept paper um, as well as the guidelines for the learning plan. You probably can't really begin working on your learning plan in much depth until you get the guidelines for the concept paper. And so a team of us are working on that right now to get that to you. I would encourage all of you, if you haven't already, to please narrow down your research interests or your research topic areas that you are going to focus on for the concept paper and the specific aims um, and meet with your mentor over the next month to discuss your research topic and, and what your study might entail. Begin to get an idea of what that might look like and flesh that out. Um, and the next step, again, will be um, really thinking about developing the concept paper and uh, that will be a very participatory process that will involve some of the uh, the processes that Kurt talked about today and that Jolt will talk in much more depth about um, on October 15th. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, we'll be in touch with the fellows and um, uh, we'll see you all on October 15th. Thanks. <coughs>